Chapter 11 to 15. The screen door of Kame House creaked as she pushed it open. Jane stood in the doorway for a moment, holding the door open behind her, hesitating, taking stock. Something was waiting for her out there, and whatever it was, she wanted to be ready for it. There was Kakarot, standing on the beach a few yards from the front porch, boots planted in the sand and expression grim. Jain's eyes slid over to glance at the person he was facing, preparing herself for the worst, but once she saw him her whole body froze and the screen door slipped from suddenly nerveless fingertips to swing back with a slam. She had wondered, from time to time, in her more morbid moments, what her firstborn child would look like now, had he survived. She had imagined him so many different ways, slight of build like her, sour of expression like Bardock. She had imagined him in Frisia armor, scouter on his face and a swagger in his step. She had pictured him in an orange turtle school GI once or twice. She had even imagined him in some other race's clothing, having secretly survived the explosion, tail hidden and hair cut. She had never thought to wonder if she would recognize him, never entertained the possibility that she wouldn't know her own son, even with an extra four feet and two and a half decades on him. The person standing on the sand outside came house, looking bewildered and a little angry, both raised the question and answered it in one heart-freezing moment. She knew him. Of course she knew him. How could she not? And he. If she had never thought to wonder if she would recognize him, she had at least known he would look different than she remembered. But it had never entered her mind to wonder if he might not recognize her. He had been so young the last time they met, and it had been so long since then. There was every possibility that he might not know her. But the expression on his face when he caught sight of her, having looked up, startled, at the door slamming shut behind her, told her there hadn't even been a moment's hesitation. He knew her. He knew his mother, just as she knew her son. Raditz. Jain whispered, for the first time in 25 years. And mother? Raditz said. Huh? Kakarot demanded, breaking the moment. Jain shook herself, and stepped down off the porch without once taking her eyes off her son, off Raditz. It was a painful joy to have to differentiate between which son she meant, because she had never, not once in her whole life, had both of them in her field of view at the same time. This is. She had to swallow a few times before she could speak. Kakarot, this is your older brother, Raditz. Kakarot's head whipped around to face his mother so fast she was worried for his neck. Then he whipped it around again, nearly as fast, to study the large scion in front of him. It turned out Raditz had grown taller than Kakarot, by a lot, and was much more solidly built. In fact, to put it plainly, he was kind of a tank, and Jain wondered briefly who he had inherited that from. She doubted her own father had been this huge, whoever he was. If he had, surely she wouldn't have been so small and slight herself. But there were other differences between them, much more subtle and dangerous ones, that caught her eye more. Kakarot was staring at his brother openly, which was a rude thing to do here on earth, but which would not trouble a scion. What would trouble him, what clearly was troubling him, was the total lack of the posturing, flexing, and sizing up that was standard practice for scions who had never met before. Kakarot was just standing there, barely even keeping up a basic guard, as though his strength were so obvious and far above the other that he didn't need to bother. If Kakarot had been a normal scion, playing by normal scion rules, his behavior would be an open insult. And Raditz, who had been young when his planet was destroyed, but hardly young enough to have failed to pick up on his own culture's social cues, was clearly feeling the insult. His fists were clenching, and though it was clear all he wanted to do was stare at his mother in disbelief, his eyes kept darting back to Kakarot, updating his threat assessment on him every few seconds. Jain had to do something before he just hauled off and punched his brother, the only civilized thing to do in response to such behavior. Raditz, she said. How are you alive? I thought. How am I alive? He demanded. How are you alive? Father told me he was sending Kakarot off-world, he didn't say one word about you. It was almost aggravating, Jain thought, how that could still sting, even all these years later. I went with him, she said, as though that were not obvious. Raditz snarled. You went with him, he mocked. Like it was that easy. Like of course you couldn't leave your child. Like it was your job to babysit instead of trying to defend your homeworld. You were always weak, but I didn't think you were this cowardly. The old Jain, the one who had been assigned to the kitchens and been grateful, had been used to this kind of talk, even from her own son. The person she had been would have stood there and taken it, because she had no argument to make and no way back one up if she had. The Jain she was now tapped her foot on the ground hard enough to create a shockwave that rocked the whole island. 
Raditz stared at her, and then closed his mouth. I asked you a question, she said softly. How did you survive? I was off-world at the time, Raditz answered sullenly. And I asked you a question. Why did you go with Kakarot? Why, Raditz bit back the words, and then shook his head and spat them out anyway. Why didn't you come looking for me? I. She trailed off, not sure what to say. His near plaintive tone hurt her heart, and in hindsight it was a good question. Had she known Raditz was off-world at the time? She couldn't remember. If she'd had even the slightest doubt that Raditz was dead, why hadn't she taken off in her pod once she was away and gone looking for him? Isn't that what a mother would do? Scion mothers might not have coddled their young the way humans did, but they did try to protect them until they were capable of doing it themselves. But Raditz had been eight years old, plenty old enough to take care of himself. Was his question even reasonable to ask? No, she realized, looking up to meet his eyes again. No, it wasn't a reasonable question, because Raditz was not thinking reasonably. She studied him again, more closely this time, and found an eloquently tragic story written in the scars on his body. Some of them were battle scars, trophies he had earned and could be proud of, but far more of them had been slowly and deliberately inflicted. He wasn't angry because she hadn't come looking for him, or because she was a coward. He was angry because he had been through hell and back and the whole time she had been not only alive, but living in paradise. Raditz, I thought everyone was dead, she said. I'm so happy you're alive, but I had every reason to think Kakarot and I were the only scions left. He glared at her, but the glare softened as he studied her, doubtless putting together her story as she had put together his. A lone scion stuck on a lush, weak planet with nowhere else to go and no reason to go there, would he not have done what she did? Would he not have stayed, and left the rest of the universe to go hang? He wet his lips, perhaps in preparation to speak, but the door to the house creaked open again, startling the three of them. Krillin and Tien peeked their heads out, openly curious, but the last thing Jain wanted right now was an audience. Go back inside, she ordered, her voice, she knew, uncommonly stern. The two of them froze, but a small shape wriggled between their legs and burst out onto the porch, running over to Kakarot. Krillin started to run after the child, but Jain waved him away. It's okay, she said, still maintaining eye contact with Raditz. This is a family matter. Almost every person on the tiny island sucked in a breath. Jain heard Krillin whispering to someone as he and Tien quickly backed up and shut the door, and Raditz was now staring at Gohan as Kakarot scooped him up and held him against his shoulder. Gohan hid his face in his father's hair, but left one eye exposed to study his uncle. Jain knew she was going to pay for her cryptic comment. It would only raise a million questions, some of which she did not wish to answer. But all that could wait. Every blood relative she had in the universe was here, right in front of her, and she wanted to keep it that way for as long as she could. When you say family. Raditz said slowly, still not quite ready to let go of his anger, but unable to hold on to it in the face of such surprising news. He was still staring at Gohan, following his gently waving tail with his eyes. Yup, Kakarot said, patting Gohan affectionately. This is my son, Gohan. Go, Han. Raditz said, trying out the word. Jain hid a smile. It would have been an atrocious name for a scion. Raditz grunted, a mostly neutral noise, but with undertones of approval. Who spawned him, then? My wife, Chi Chi, Kakarot explained. He's named after my grandpa Gohan. He's the human that me and Ma lived with when I was a baby. Say, you should live here with us, too. Wa, me? Live here? With you? Raditz almost sounded amused, helpless in the face of one absurdity after another. Jain smiled, a part of her, a silly part, she knew, already imagining which room she would put him in and which of Ox King's shirts would be small enough for him to borrow. None of Kakarot's clothes would fit, that was for sure. There was something like a smile growing on Raditz's face as well, a small, rusty thing that looked disused and slightly painful. He lifted his hand to his face, perhaps to brush away an errant strand of hair or put his hand on the back of his neck, but that was a gesture Kakarot would have made, Jain reminded herself, and Raditz was not a man who would have time for bashfulness. Whatever the gesture might have been, the second his fingers touched the scouter on his ear the smile faded. He stood there for a long moment, working something out in his mind, and then removed the scouter from his ear. Then, with slow deliberateness, making sure Jain could see what he was doing, he closed his finger over the microphone hole. We are not the only scions left, he said, and it was clear this was not supposed to be good news. Prince Vegeta and an elite named Nappa also survived. 
I work for them, and they are the ones who sent me here. We needed more muscle for a job and I remembered I had a brother tucked away somewhere. He met Kakarot's eyes meaningfully. I came here to bring you back to them. Kakarot shifted uneasily, sensing a fight, but Raditz just chuckled darkly. It's clear to me you wouldn't survive one day out there in the Frisia Force. You're just as weak as I am and even more of a moron. And you, he added, turning to Jine, you were never even supposed to be here. If I tried to take you back with me you'd be eaten alive. So then you'll stay. Kakarot said hopefully, but Jine knew, with a sudden, horrible certainty, that that was not what Raditz had in mind. Of course not, idiot, Raditz said to his brother. If I did that Vegeta would just come here himself, and then we'd all be dead. But you can't just go back, Jine said desperately. I know the reputation of that family, Prince Vegeta is not going to be pleased if you return empty-handed. You have to stay here. Raditz shook his head sadly. I'm not going to drag you into this, he said. There's no point in all of us being slaughtered. You can't just go off to die. Jine protested. Not when I just found out you're alive. The smile Raditz gave her was wicked, and a little sad. Oh, I don't plan on dying. Not for real, anyway. But Vegeta won't bother trying to kill someone he thinks is dead. He had always been a tricky little weasel, Jine suddenly remembered. Bardock had been a bit disgusted with him, but he had been the type of kid who would pretend to be beaten only to sneak attack his opponent once they turned their back on him. It hadn't won him any friends, but it had won him fights he would have lost in fair combat. If any scion would do something like fake his own death to get out of a fight, it was Raditz. Don't you do anything stupid, she scolded, even as her heart constricted. You've survived this long, don't do anything to mess that up. Raditz scoffed, looking away in disgust. You don't know what you're talking about, he spat. If I told you half the things I've done to survive you'd be so disgusted you'd kill me yourself. He was trying to be flippant, but he just looked wretched. Jine, even though she knew better, even though she knew that to her son, born among scions and then raised in who knows what hellish conditions, any gesture of comfort would be seen as confirmation of his weakness, still couldn't help stepping forward and placing her hands gently on her son's cheeks. His teeth bared at the touch, almost as though it hurt, but he didn't pull away or knock her down. She stroked her thumbs over his cheeks, trying to ease the expression of pain she found there, even if she could do nothing to ease the pain itself. It doesn't matter, she whispered. She could imagine some of what he was alluding to. Even in her brief time in the scouts there had been rituals, games played with helpless natives, cruelty that went beyond simple extermination. Even for a scion, Frisia's way of doing things took some deadening of the conscience. Whatever you've done, it doesn't matter to me. You're alive, and that's all I care about. Perhaps if Raditz had been a different man, he might have shed tears. She could see the ghosts of them in the creases around his eyes, the shakiness of his breath. But he did not weep. Whatever he had been through, he was beyond weeping, and Jine knew that, later, she would weep enough tears for the both of them. The scouter still in his grip, Raditz pulled her hands down from his cheeks and backed away. Then he replaced the scouter over his ear, turned, and was about to fly off when he angled his head over his shoulder and fixed Kakarot with a meaningful look. Whatever he was trying to communicate, Kakarot seemed to understand, because he nodded gravely. Raditz nodded back, gave Jine one last, sad look, and then leaped into the air and rocketed away. In mere seconds he was gone from view. Instantly the screen door slammed open and the occupants of Kame House spilled out onto the beach, crowding around and demanding answers. Kakarot, grimly, began explaining, but all Jine could do was stare up at the sky, and try to hold back the tears, and hope. Both her children were alive. But they might not be for long. People crowded around Jine and Kakarot on the beach in front of Kame House, their collective voices raised in a thousand questions. Kakarot was trying to answer them all at once, but his explanations, as usual, only left them more confused. Jine sought out Grandpa Gohan's comforting, wrinkled face, and the noise fell away as it became clear his questions were the only ones she was going to answer. Who was that just now? Gohan asked. Jine felt her whole body constrict as she fought the tears that sprang up at the very thought. Kakarot answered for her. That was my bro, he said proudly. His words caused another burst of noise from the assembled crowd. You're what? Was he a scion? Where did he go? What was he doing here? You have a brother? Krillin said in astonishment. He turned and looked at Jine, and she dashed away her tears. This was not the time for sentimentality. Yes, and he brought news, she said. She looked at Gohan as she spoke. 
We are not the only scions left. That's great. Yamcha exclaimed. How many survivors are there? He only mentioned the two, Jain said, her blood turning cold as she realized there might be more, Raditz hadn't made it clear. And it's not great. It's terrible. There was a pause as everyone's tentative smiles began fading. I would have thought you'd be happy more of you survived, Rashi said, puzzled. Jain shook her head slowly. Not these two. Nappa, I think I remember that name. Raditz said he's an elite, and if he's who I'm thinking of he's the prince's right-hand man. He'll do anything he says. A prince? Bulma said with interest, and Jain gave her a sharp look. He's no knight in shining armor, Bulma. He and his line were the most vicious, powerful scions of all, which was why they were in charge. Is he coming here? Krillin asked, face white. Jain's tail lashed behind her in sharp, jerky motions. I don't know, she said, beginning to pace. Raditz was going to fake his own death, but I don't know if that will be enough to draw them away. When the royal family wants something they get it, and the prince won't be happy about being defied like that. But what does he want? Tien asked, and Jain looked at her son. Kakarot, she said, and Kakarot regarded her solemnly. He looked more like his father when he wasn't smiling. She hadn't thought of Bardock in years, and she didn't want to be thinking of him now. And me, probably, now that they know I'm here. What would they want Kakarot for? Yamcha scoffed. To help them do their dirty work, Jain said, feeling her fists clench of their own accord. Well, we can just tell them no thank you, Krillin said. And if they get rude, Kakarot can show them the door. Although it does seem like a shame your own brother has to run away from these guys. I would have liked to meet him. Jain stared at Krillin, his little hands on his hips in a cocky stance as he looked up at Kakarot in perfect faith. Somehow she had forgotten that none of them understood how weak she was. Again her eyes found Gohan's, which were calm. He was waiting for her. That isn't going to work, Krillin, she said. He only looked puzzled, still secure in his faith in them. Jain breathed in deep and then let it out slowly. I know all of you think I'm strong, but the truth is I'm the weakest of my kind. If those two scions really are coming here, then we don't stand a chance. Come on, Yamcha scoffed uneasily. You're joking, right? You and Kakarot are crazy strong. You even trained with Kami. What do these guys have on you? It was no use. They all thought too much of her. Jain looked one by one at all the faces around her, Yamcha, Puar, Krillin, Tien, Kaiatsu. Launch and Bulma and Grandpa Gohan. Rashi and Oolong and Turtle. Even Kakarot and Little Gohan, they were all looking at her with hope in their eyes, and she couldn't bear it. Why won't you get it through your thick heads, she shouted, startling them all. If those two make planet fall we are dead. And we don't even know if they're coming or not. We can ask Kami about that, Kakarot piped up, looking at her over Little Gohan's head. He'll know. Jain began to argue, but found she had no argument to make. Why wouldn't he Kami be able to tell if two aliens across the galaxy had murderous intent towards the Earth? It would hardly be the strangest thing she'd ever seen. Fine, she said. We'll go ask him. The truth was, she admitted to herself as Kakarot handed Gohan to Krillin and they flew away, she was hoping Kami would tell them she was worried over nothing. That Raditz's plan would work, that Nappa and Vegeta had no interest in Kakarot or herself, that they were safe. But when the old Namikian's eyes opened after contemplating the matter for some minutes, she knew that was not what he was going to tell her. There are two powerful energies headed for Earth as we speak, he said gravely. At their current speed I estimate it will take them a year to get here. And they aren't just powerful, they mean the people of Earth great harm. I'm afraid you are right, Jain. All right, Kakarot said eagerly. When do we start training? Kami regarded him with a sad smile. You aren't. I have nothing left to teach you. Jain felt her throat constrict. What do you mean? You are both far beyond my power now. I have passed on what wisdom I have, and it is up to you to act on it. There is nothing more I can do for you. I'm sorry. And he really looked it. But, despite more arguing from Kakarot, that was the last word on the subject. Jain and Kakarot descended from the lookout in grim silence. At first she thought he'd finally come to understand the threat, but halfway there he broke the silence to say. Well, looks like we've got to train on our own. And of course he sounded excited about it. Jain nearly clobbered him right there in midair, but she made a heroic effort and refrained. 
When they arrived back at Kame House and relayed the news, everyone went solemn, but still retained the same optimism as Kakarot. It was infuriating, and after a few half-hearted attempts by Krillin and Bulma to come up with a plan that didn't involve relying on Kakarot and Jine to save the day, she stood and addressed Tien. I believe you've been wanting to have a match with me. Tien blinked all three eyes at her, his eagerness warring with his practicality. I, ah, uh, that is, yes, but this hardly seems like the time. Jine craned her neck to the side, cracking it, then tilted it over to the other side. On the contrary, she said. This is the perfect time. To his credit Tien held his ground. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we have more important things to worry about right now. Jine gave him a plastic smile. Trust me, this will only take a second. Tien didn't have an ounce of bluster in him, but even he would not allow a jab at his pride like that to stand. His face darkened, and he stood. The two of them went outside, facing each other on the beach, and Jine could feel Tien using all his faculties to feel her out. He was looking for openings, gaps in her stance or her attention to exploit, and she dropped her guard entirely, not only to deliberately give him an opening, but also to teach him a lesson about facing opponents who were inferior in skill but overwhelming in power. To someone like Tien, used to fighting opponents who had spent years honing their skills under the tutelage of a master, Prince Vegeta would not read like a skillful opponent. That apparent lack of skill would cause him to rush in, as he was doing now, and get a nasty surprise, as Jine was about to give him. At least Jine's surprise wouldn't cost him his life. Tien blew past the place where Jine's defenses should have been, his fingers extended and aiming at chakra points. He jabbed her solar plexus, throat, and forehead several times in quick succession, then danced behind her and elbowed her in the small of her back. All to no avail. She stood, not yielding even an inch, arms lightly folded across her stomach as though she were waiting in line at the grocery store. When he appeared in front of her, breathing hard with exertion, his eyes were wide in astonishment. And my attacks did nothing. She regarded him calmly. Would you like to try again? He growled and dashed forward, even faster this time, hitting joints and soft spots, pelting her with blows that had every ounce of his strength in them, with exactly the same result. Jine smoothed the front of her dress where some of his hits had wrinkled the fabric, and then glanced up at him, sighing. He was starting to understand. Now to drive the point home. With a growl that began deep in her chest, Jine called on the reserves of energy swirling in her core, pulling them up and amplifying them. Like a geyser, the power rose in time with her increasing yell, shooting up and out until the wind was blowing at hurricane speeds around her. The ground shook, and the laconic ocean waves grew erratic and agitated. Tien was driven to his knees, one arm thrown over his eyes as sand whipped everywhere. When her power had reached its full height, Jine let it drop, everything falling to eerie silence after the furious noise of wind and water and earth being whipped into unnatural frenzy. Tien wasted no time being overawed, and as soon as the pressure of her energy let up, he burst to his feet, ready to resume his attack. He lunged at her again, fist clenched and aiming to kill. At least he'd understood that much. But with one hand she grabbed his fist and twisted it 180 degrees, taking him along with it. Tien slammed into the sand on his back, gasping painfully as the wind was knocked out of him. Jine stood over him, balancing her foot lightly but insistently on his neck. After a moment, Tien lay back in the sand, defeated. When I came here I was the weakest scion that had ever lived, she told him, knowing that everyone else had crept out onto the porch and was listening. Even now my power would make me a solid low-class scion, good for nothing more than routine dirty work. The scions coming here are ten times more powerful than this. Do I make myself clear? She removed her foot, ready to help Tien up. But she had not made herself clear, it seemed, because as soon as she extended her hand he grabbed it, obviously intending to pull her off balance and continue the fight. Faster than Tien could probably see, she twisted in midair and brought her elbow down on his stomach. Tien's eyes rolled back into his head and his mouth gaped wide, spittle flying as he wheezed a painful breath. Launch flung herself off the porch and slid to a stop next to him, cradling his head and calling his name, but he was already unconscious. You didn't have to go that far, she shouted up at Jine, who was brushing sand from her dress. The scions coming here are ten times more powerful than me, she repeated, her voice calm but her mind in turmoil. She wanted to make them understand, but what favor was she really doing them? Knowing what was coming, instead of it being a surprise, was that kindness. But they are a million times more cruel. Scions have no concept of honor or mercy. They, her voice broke, but she forced herself to go on. They slaughtered entire worlds for profit and fun. 
Every scion I knew had the blood of billions of beings on their hands. And they were proud of it. That is what's coming here. That is what we have to face. Now do you understand? No one answered her. She couldn't stand to look at them, all shuffling in place and silent, so when Kakarot spoke, it came as a surprise. You, he looked confused, hurt. You said Scions were warriors. His tone was accusatory, pleading, asking her to take it back, deny it, let the world be as it had been before. She had never told him, she realized. Grandpa Gohan had known, but somehow it had never come up around Kakarot. She had never told him much about her people, and he had rarely asked. But somehow she had expected that one basic truth, that Scions were bloodthirsty brutes, to be transmitted anyway. And it hadn't. Warriors, yes, she said. But not good. Not kind. Not a single one of them. His harrowed expression was a weight on her heart. She hadn't meant to deceive him. She just hadn't wanted to remember. Tien groaned at her feet, and she stepped away from him, glad to have somewhere else to look. Before she could do anything else, however, she heard Kami's voice speaking in her head. Greetings. Can you hear me? The shocked reaction of the crowd on the beach told Jain she wasn't the only one he was speaking to. Aloud, she answered. Yes, we hear you Kami. What is it? I've been speaking with my superiors and I believe I may have a way to help you after all. God has superiors. Jain heard Bulma mutter in amazement. Kami went on. There is a martial arts master in Otherworld who is familiar with Scions and the threat they pose. He has agreed to give special dispensation for one mortal to train with him. Jain's mind raced, hope blooming in her chest for the first time since Raditz had given them the news. She heard Rashi saying. Who is this master? Is he someone we know? No, Kami answered. He is the Lord of Worlds, known as King Kai, and he has agreed to help us face this threat. Whichever person you choose to receive the training will need to come to me, and quickly. We do not have much time, and the way to King Kai is long and arduous. The Lord of the Dead has agreed to allow a living mortal to pass into his realm, but he is not patient, and he may overturn his decision if he is kept waiting. The Lord of the Dead. Bulma cried in horror. So whoever does the training's gotta die. Oolong squealed. He said a living mortal, dumbass, launch snapped. Which one of us should it be? Kakarot asked, and everyone turned to him, dumbfounded. I think that much is obvious, Tien croaked, getting laboriously to his feet. He waved off Launch's attentions and stood gingerly. You're the one to go, Kakarot. Me? Kakarot repeated dumbly. But what about you, Ma? Don't you wanna go? He turned to her, his earlier dismay seemingly forgotten. She smiled, despite everything, and shook her head. I don't. It really should be you, son. His frown did not lift. But I wanted to train with you, he said forlornly. Jain cupped her son's cheek in one hand, memorizing his face as she realized she wouldn't be seeing it again for a year. You need to be ready to protect your home, Kakarot, she said. Besides, I'll be training the others while you're gone. The fighters in the group blossomed at this, their hope rising higher than Jain's. She was less certain of their doom than she had been a minute ago, but the thought of coming face to face with the prince left her cold with dread. Kakarot was still hesitating, and she pushed him gently away. Go, she said. He took a long look at her, slowly handed her little Gohan, and then hugged her, swiftly but tightly. Then he was gone, and the beach, though still crowded, felt empty. No! Chi Chi shouted, unfolding a bedsheet with a snap so hard the sheet tore in half. In her rage she didn't notice and tucked it on the bed anyway. Absolutely not. Bad enough I'm expected to put up four layabouts on top of all the other work I do around here, but now you wanna take Gohan away and turn him into a meathead like his father? Jain followed her daughter-in-law helplessly around the brand new capsule house as she prepared it to receive guests, making beds and airing out rooms, setting electronics, and engaging the temporary foundations. Thank the gods Bulma handed out capsules like candy, if Chi Chi had been asked to accommodate four fighters in her own house she might have imploded. I don't want to take him away, Jain said calmly as Chi Chi fluffed a pillow and scattered feathers around the room. I want you to come with us. Chi Chi threw a comforter over the bed, moving on to the next one before it had even landed. As Jain watched it settled into place seemingly on its own, corners draping themselves elegantly as they fell. And do what? Chi Chi demanded as she made hospital corners on the next bed. Do laundry in the river while the rest of you teach Gohan how to be a delinquent? 
Jain sighed. She knew perfectly well Chi Chi was angry Kakarot had left without saying goodbye, scared the earth might be destroyed, and worried for her son. This was simply how she coped, trying to control what little she could and ignoring the rest. Often, it worked. She managed Kakarot a lot better than Jain ever had. But this time she wished the girl would just be reasonable. Chi Chi, I'm asking you to come with him so he can keep studying. It was enough to halt Chi Chi's mad rush around the house for a second or two, but only that. He can study here. He doesn't need to go out in the woods and learn how to punch people. Chi Chi, you were a martial artist, Jain pointed out, exasperated. You punched people all the time. I was, Chi Chi said, pulling out another storage capsule and unpopping it. Inside were several trunks full of old quilts and sheets, as well as baby clothes and knickknacks, which she sorted through impatiently. But I don't want Gohan to grow up like his father. You did your best with him, but Gohan has potential, and I won't see it wasted. This line of attack was going nowhere. Jain had to try the other thing. She hadn't planned on bringing it up until the issue of Gohan was settled, but it seemed that was not to be. Didn't you like being a martial artist? She asked. She was pretty sure she knew the answer, but if she was wrong she might have to do something drastic. Yes, of course, Chi Chi snapped without looking up from the box of trinkets she was sorting through, but then her words caught up with her and she stopped. Her eyes went distant, and she rubbed the object in her hands thoughtfully. Jain craned her head, and saw that it was the envelope that had held the prize money from the 23rd Tenkechi Budokai. She smiled. She was right. Chi Chi came to herself and glared. What's that got to do with anything? She stuffed the envelope back into the album she had taken it from and recapsulized everything, minus the bedclothes, which she began unfolding. Jain took up a sheet and worked on one of the other beds. Well, why did you stop? She asked, tugging at the corners until they were straight. What was the point? Training takes up too much time. Just seeing to Gohan's studies is a full-time job, and then there's cooking and cleaning for everyone, and keeping Kakarot in line is, well, you know how that is. Jain knew how that was. But what if you did have time, she pressed. What if you didn't have to worry about all that? Would you want to keep training? Chi Chi gave an exasperated sigh. Of course I liked Sparin with Kakarot back when we were kids. But we're not kids anymore, and I'm not going to let Gohan grow up thinking he can solve all his problems with violence. Jain dropped the pillow she was trying to stuff into its pillowcase and fixed her daughter-in-law with a stern look. Some problems can only be solved with violence, she said firmly. And this is one of them. And I'm doing my part, Chi Chi retorted. You see me, putting up accommodations for Kakarot's delinquent friends without a word of complaint because I know they need some place to train. But I don't see why you want to drag Gohan into all this. He's going to get dragged into it whether we want it or not. Jain saw Chi Chi bite her lip as she bent over to smooth out some wrinkles on the bed. Those two scions are going to be very curious about a species that can interbreed with scions. I've certainly never heard of such a thing before. And they're going to want to know how strong he is. If we can't stop them they're going to come after him. If you can't stop them then what chance does he have anyway? Chi Chi wailed, throwing up her hands. He's four. When I was four my mother kicked me out of the house. Jain returned Chi Chi's horrified look with a wry smile. Don't look like that. We didn't like each other and I was perfectly capable of fending for myself. I would have left soon anyway if she hadn't forced the issue. Well, that's all fine and good for you science, Chi Chi huffed, turning back to her task. But Gohan's human, and it's not normal for a four-year-old human to be doing anything but staying at home with his mother. Gohan's not human, Jain said. Not entirely. He has potential, Chi Chi you can see it in his mind, but I can see it in his body. He's strong, I know he is. And he's clever. Those two things together will make him a force to be reckoned with. At the mention of training Gohan again, Chi Chi grunted in annoyance and left the room, moving to the bathroom to stock it with linens and toiletries. Jain followed slowly, at her wit's end with this girl who called her Ma. Her own mother had been cold and perpetually disappointed, and Jain had never known Chi Chi as a child, so sometimes she found herself totally unable to figure out how she was supposed to relate to her. She was a daughter, but not her child. She was a friend, but also family. And sometimes, every so often, her stubbornness would become an impenetrable wall. As a scion, Jain's natural reaction to a wall she needed to get past was to smash it. As an earthling, she needed to try something different. Chi Chi, dear, she said softly, 
leaning a hand on the doorway as Chi Chi slammed bottles into baskets and baskets into cupboards, I want you and Gohan there with us. I don't want to be without my family for a whole year. Chi Chi stopped, leaning a pink plastic bucket full of shampoo and conditioner bottles against the edge of the sink and staring at herself in the mirror. They're a bunch of boorish louts with no manners or sense, and I don't want them teaching Gohan to be like them, she said, but she was no longer shouting. Jain gave her another gentle push. You'll be teaching him, dear. Jain hid a smile as Chi Chi whipped her head around. And I'll be teaching you. I want both of you to train with us. You have potential too, you know. I'm not, I can't train with, I'm too far behind. Chi Chi looked away from her own reflection and down at herself, tugging at the sash around her waist pensively. Jain let her think. Chi Chi worried her lower lip between her teeth for a long time. I'm too far behind, she said again, and Jain knew she had one. I don't know who you think you're talking to, she said brightly, taking the basket of shampoos from her daughter's hands, but I know a thing or two about being behind. That won't be a problem. And I don't know what you're thinking, stocking this much shampoo for three baldies. Jain saw Chi Chi mouth the names, Tien, Kaiatsu, and Krillin, and then laugh. Yamcha has enough hair for all of them, she said, taking the basket back. And these are nearly expired, they need to be used up. Humming, Chi Chi stopped the rest of the bathroom quickly, but without the violence in her motion of just moments ago, and when she was done she breezed past Jain and stood in the living room, surveying her work with a pleased air. Well, that's that. When did you say they were coming, again? They should be here in a few hours, Jain said, glancing at a wall clock. Chi Chi's hands flew to her face. Goodness gracious, I thought I had more time. I need to get lunch started, and check on Gohan's math assignment, and Gramps said he's running low on ointment. Jain put her arm around Chi Chi's shoulders and led her to the door, smiling. Let me help you. We need to get Chi Chi flying, Yamcha said during the midday break. He, Jain, Tien, Krillin and Kaiatsu were sitting on the lush grass at the edge of a meadow a few mountains over from Mkipauzu where they had set up camp. The five of them were ranged in a semicircle under tree cover, cooling off after a morning of exertion. Chi Chi was nearby, drilling Gohan in science terms with flashcards while the boy ate lunch. Yamcha was right, of course, but Jain didn't know why he was bringing it up now. They were all painfully aware that Chi Chi was the only one who hadn't mastered Buku Jutsu, Chi Chi most of all. We've all tried explaining it to her, Tien said, echoing Jain's thoughts. All we can do now is hope she figures it out on her own. That's what I'm getting at, Yamcha countered. We haven't all tried. He looked directly at Jain. You've been flying since you were a kid. How come you never give her any advice? Jain stared back at him, nonplussed. My mother threw me off a cliff when I was three, she said. I have no advice to give. They stared at her in horror. Krillin was the first to break the awkward silence by clearing his throat. Oh okay, but you must have taught Kakarot how to fly. You, you didn't throw him off a cliff, did you, he added, gulping. Jain chuckled drilly. I never taught Kakarot how to fly, she said, watching Gohan triumphantly shout an answer and accidentally spray Chi Chi with crumbs. He picked it up on his own. Like most Scion children. There was another, longer awkward silence. Not for the first time, Jain wished Grandpa Gohan had agreed to train with them. She had asked him to, the night before their training officially started, but he had only looked thoughtfully at the fighters assembled in the yard and told her there was nothing he could teach them that they couldn't teach each other. Jain still wasn't sure what she could offer anyone other than a challenging sparring partner, but Tien and Kaiatsu had been able to teach the Kame school students how to fly and they in turn had shown Chi Chi that farm chores could also be training. Chi Chi had been ecstatic, and M. Tupauzu was now the proud owner of a very productive field of radishes, with fields of carrots and spring onions well on their way. Chi Chi switched to math, and Jain asked the others in a whisper. What is the quadratic equation, anyway? Tien, Kaiatsu and Yamcha all shrugged in unison, but Krillin straightened up and began to recite. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, he said proudly. His audience oot appreciatively. How do you know that? Jain asked in awe. Master Rashi always said we should train our minds as well as our bodies, he said. So what is it for, she asked, and his proud grin faltered. Stop changing the subject, he said, frowning at her. We need to get Chi Chi up to speed or she might decide this is a waste of time and take Gohan home with her. That wasn't likely, in Jain's mind at least, but Chi Chi's lack of progress was a problem. 
The girl, as demure and sweet as she liked to appear, was a brawler born and bred. Using ki to add strength and fortitude to her own body came as natural as breathing, but focusing the raw destructive power of ki energy in her palm or using it to fly were seemingly beyond her. In six months she hadn't been able to do more than heat up her hands, even though her speed and strength were increasing day by day. Jine didn't think she would actually pick up and leave if she didn't get it soon, but she might give up on ki control as not worth her time. When Chi Chi got frustrated she tended to blame anything but herself. The problem is she tries too hard, Yangzhi mused out loud. And thinks too much, Tian agreed. But how do we get her to stop thinking? Kaiatsu wondered. They pondered the question in silence for the rest of the break, but made no headway. As they performed their pre-training stretches, Yangzhi mused out loud. Hey, Chi Chi, whatever happened to that helmet you used to have? Chi Chi straightened out of a deep lunge to stare at him. What helmet? Yamcha looked up from his hurdler's stretch in surprise. You know, that helmet with the blade on top you used to wear. You had it on it when we first met. Chi Chi gasped, then put her hands on her hips and regarded him sternly. Yamcha, I'm surprised at you, she exclaimed. And you with a girlfriend no less. Yamcha looked bewildered. What are you talking about? Chi Chi tisked and shook her head. I know you had feelings for me back then, but I couldn't return them, and I thought we'd both moved on. Yamcha shrunk under the sudden scrutiny of five sets of eyes. I didn't, I wasn't, you, I was just wondering what you did with it, that's all. He leaned over his other leg, cheeks flaming. Well, if that's all it is, Chi Chi said primly, resuming her lunges. I put it away as soon as I got engaged to Kakarot. It was too childish for a young lady about to be married. I wouldn't call taking out a dinosaur in one go, childish, Yamcha muttered. Krillin heard, and turned to Chi Chi with raised eyebrows. You took out a dinosaur with a helmet? What did you do, headbutt it? I did no such thing. Chi Chi exclaimed. The blade came off, like this. She put her arms over her head, palms together. Between her hands energy began to glow in the shape of a scythe, unbeknownst to her and to the breathless anticipation of everyone else. Closing her eyes, she flung the energy scythe forward, sending it whistling through the air straight at Yamcha. He barely managed to fling himself out of the way in time, a sizable chunk of his hair being not so lucky. The blade arced around in a large curve, mowing down several trees before returning to Chi Chi's head. Gohan's eyes were wide. Wow, mom, that was amazing. Chi Chi opened her eyes, blushing, and the energy dissipated. There's nothing amazing about playing pretend, Gohan. Now finish your stretches, young man, you don't want to cramp up. Chi Chi. Krillin spluttered. Do you know what you just did? You mean besides making a fool of myself reminiscing? Chi Chi snapped. You just performed an energy attack, Tian informed her. A powerful one. What are you talking about? Chi Chi demanded, but then she caught sight of Yamcha, who was pulling at his ruined ponytail in dismay, and the massacred trees behind him. Her eyes went wide. Was, that me? She looked down at her hands in amazement, and then back up at the carnage she had wrought. Slowly she put her palms together over her head again, but no energy appeared between them, and she scowled. Jine smiled. The girl would get it soon enough. She wasn't Kakarot's wife for nothing, after all. Jine's boots shushed softly against the leaf litter of the forest floor, little Gohan clambering more noisily behind her. He struggled over a fallen tree, fell, and ran to catch up, clutching for her hand and then settling for the hem of her dress when she did not lower it for him. Jine had told Chi Chi they were going for a walk, but what the girl didn't know couldn't hurt her. It was time for Gohan's first hunt. A pure-blooded scion child his age would have already been playing pounce games with his parents' tails for years and probably have managed to catch a few lizards, but despite the tail waving behind him, Gohan didn't seem to have an ounce of killer instinct in his body. Wow, grandma, look! Gohan exclaimed, tugging at her dress and pointing. A metasequoia glyptostroboids. They're rare in this area. And there's a Chrysolophus pictus roosting in it. Oh, look, a Physignathus cosinsinus. It just went behind that bush. Did you see it? Put simply, Jine thought, as she stared at the bird in a tree and listened to the lizard scuttling into cover, the boy was an incorrigible egghead. He was strong and growing stronger every day, he knew every kata of both the turtle school and the crane school by heart, had learned how to fly in a day and was able to meditate like someone three times his age, but if Bardock had been ashamed of Raditz for being wily, she didn't know wave make of his grandson. 
Gohan, she said, kneeling down to look him in the eye. Do you know why we're out here? Gohan blinked. A nature walk, he ventured. Jain shook her head. We're here to hunt, she told him. His sweet little face went serious as he thought about this. You mean me, don't you? He said, tucking his chin onto his chest. At least those brains worked both ways. Bulma was smart too, but she could be oblivious when it came to matters of common sense. Jain nodded. I'll show you the basics, but then it'll be up to you. You ready? She stood, but Gohan tugged at her dress again. Not an endangered species, he said firmly, and she smiled. After a few brief lessons in stalking, wind direction, and camouflage, Jain dropped behind Gohan and let him lead the way. She could already tell there was a herd of deer up the mountain to the east, but if Gohan couldn't even find his prey then there was no point in teaching him how to kill it. Sure enough, he walked in the opposite direction of the deer, and Jain reminded herself that failure was as good a teacher as success. To her surprise, though, in just a few minutes they were crouched at the edge of a slight clearing where an enormous tree had spread its branches, a flock of small birds roosting in its roots. Arborophila rufagularis, Gohan whispered. Jain nodded. The clearing would make it difficult to get very close, but these birds tended to run rather than fly. All in all, not bad for a first attempt. She watched as Gohan closed his eyes, and felt as he settled his energy to be as inconspicuous as possible. Probably not necessary with fowl, but it couldn't hurt. Opening his eyes, he crept around the edge of the clearing until he was hidden in a vast fern. From her vantage point, Jain could barely see him, and the birds remained unconcerned. Without warning, a rock sailed out of the fern into the middle of the flock, its angle making it seem to the birds as though it had come from another direction, and they ran from it, straight into Gohan's hiding place. After a confusion of feathers and squawking, Gohan leaped out of the fern with a triumphant yell, the neck of a struggling bird held tightly in his hand. I got one, Grandma. I got one. She stood slowly in amazement. Gohan ran to her, grinning, and thrust the bird forward to show her. Did you see? I caught it. Did you see me? That was incredible, Gohan, Jain said, beginning to grin herself. Even Kakarot hadn't gotten a kill on his first try. Brain's guiding brawn was a force to be reckoned with indeed. Maybe she'd been worried over nothing. Here, Gohan said, holding the bird out for her to take, and Jain's smile slid off her face. She did not move. Gohan held it out a few inches farther. For you, he said. What am I supposed to do with it? she said, and the smile slid off his face as well. He looked at the still struggling bird, and then back at her, holding it out again. I got it, he said. I did it. You're not finished. The boy gaped at her, his mind refusing to comprehend what she wanted. But. You mean. I should carry it home. He looked up at her hopefully, and she shook her head. Not like that you shouldn't. Gohan looked down at the bird once more, then up at her, and Jain made two fists in the air, twisting them sharply in opposite directions. Instantly Gohan's face went white, and he must have loosened his grip, because the bird gave a loud whistle and flapped its wings until it was free, running away as fast as its little legs could carry it. Neither Gohan nor Jain watched it go. Gohan was staring at his grandmother, lower lip trembling. I. I don't wanna, he hiccuped, and Jain looked at his sweet, miserable little face and wondered what else she had been expecting. Okay, she said simply, and turned around, heading back down the mountain toward camp. Gohan clambered after her, and this time, when he reached for her hand, she let him take it. For the rest of the day Jain thought long and hard about Kakarot's early hunting experiences, games he delighted to master, and her own, matters of survival, but found nothing to guide her on how to help her grandson overcome this hurdle, or even if she should. But that evening she caught Gohan looking thoughtfully at the roast duck Yamcha had bagged by accident while practicing his spirit ball technique. She watched him look from Yamcha, who was joking with Krillin, to Chi Chi, who had plucked and dressed it, and then down at his plate more than once before the meal was through, and she thought maybe she could let him decide. Early the next day Gohan grabbed Jain's hand and led her into the forest, not letting go until they'd been walking for nearly half an hour. He dropped into a crouch and in a few seconds was out of sight. Jain was pretty sure he was stalking a rabbit, much quicker and more alert prey than roosting birds, so she was unsurprised when he re-emerged a few minutes later frustrated and empty-handed. He led her through the forest for a few more minutes before spotting something else, only to return with nothing to show for it once more. After a few rounds of this he finally bagged another bird, a large flightless thing he didn't tell her the scientific name of. It struggled and squawked, but he gripped it tightly, 
asking her a question with his eyes. Hold it here and here, she told him, and he did. Twist like this as hard as you can, as fast as you can. You don't want it to suffer. He nodded, took a few quick breaths, then squeezed his eyes shut and wrung his hands. There was a snap, and the bird fell limp. Very good, Jain murmured, and Gohan opened his eyes, looking down at the bird in his hands like he expected it to scold him. When it did nothing but hang there, he blinked a few times, and then looked up at Jain. He seemed almost surprised. The important thing, to Jain at least, was that he did not cry. A good kill, she said. Your mother will make it into a tasty dish. Yeah, Gohan agreed thoughtfully, and together they descended the mountain. When they were nearly in sight of the camp, Gohan turned to her and held out the dead bird. You take it, he said. I don't think mom would like it if she knew I killed it. Jain hesitated. The boy was probably right. Chi Chi would faint dead away if she knew her baby had been out wringing the necks of the local wildlife. It was just, she thought, taking the bird, that a scion's first kill ought to be celebrated. It was the first tangible sign that you were worth something, that you weren't just an empty mouth but a member of society. A person. It was an occasion for boasting, for dancing, and teasing from adults who, just the day before, had treated you as though you didn't exist. A scion's first kill was a good thing. This was all true, and so Jain did not know, as she watched Gohan go up to his mother and hug her, why she felt like crying. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.